Well, welcome everybody to our reverence virtual program with the Grammary Art Colony and Steven Spazuk and Daniel Delas. And we're so excited to share this event with you and that you're attending. Um, for those of you who are new to our organization, my name is Ruth Pizzuaro, I'm the Artistic Director, and we are a nonprofit arts organization. We serve artists and arts learners through classes, residencies, and signature events. And we're located on the North Shore of Lake Superior in the Great Lakes region in Minnesota. And we're going to turn 75 next year. So we're very excited about that anniversary. Um, throughout this year and next year, we're looking at the theme of fire, which was how I was first introduced to Stephen's work. And then subsequently to Danielle, I was looking at and researching about artists who work with fire. And uh, here, voila, there was Stephen. And it was so fun to learn about his work. And the other intersection that we've had is that as an organization, we look at that that space between art and ecology and uh, just matched so well with their reverence project and what they're exploring as well. And I'm going to let them talk through that. Just a, a note to say we are looking at next year of doing a reverence project with them in our community and, and more details will be coming on that. Um, but by way of introduction, just going to introduce uh, the two of them. Danielle is a Canadian education consultant and science specialist. She's the director of Pedagogia Incorporated, a company offering consulting services in sustainable education. Her work spans a wide range of services from teaching, uh, sustainability program development, curricular design, and biomimicry thinking. Steven is a professional visual artist known internationally for his work with fire, the transparency, fluidity, and unpredictability of soot from burning flames define his images and his technique, uh, which he's dubbed uh, fumage, is just, is just fantastic and really excited to share with you their project and his work as well. Um, particularly this year, I don't know, in our area, we are in drought right now. And as you see, we're exploring the duality of, of fire as both destructive and constructive we're, we're feeling, you know, feeling that there's fires in Southern Canada, just across the border, lots of smoke coming our way, different things happening. Um, and that's not just our own experience. So there's so many ways to look at that. Um, before we get started, thank you so much, both of you for being here and, and sharing your work with our arts community. We are going to do Q and A uh, three different times. And we'll stop and make sure you know if you have questions, you can, you can ask them through the Q&A option. So if you hover over your menu bar, you'll see Q&A. Sometimes webinars do this through chat. It's a little, a little easier on our part to manage it through Q&A. So, um, so we're not doing the chat or the raise your hand options for this event. And um, once I'm done speaking, I'm going to exit and there will be several video clips that uh, should be viewable and, and enjoyable for you to watch. We'll make sure that that tech is working well. And then our presentation will be recorded. So if you have friends who were not able to come or you want to share it, we in the coming weeks will have that shared on social media. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over and let you both take it away. Well, thank you, Ruth. Uh, we're delighted to be here with you guys. Uh, we're live from Montreal, um, and we are going to spend a, around an hour together, and we'll explain our Spazic de las uh, Reverence project. Like uh, Ruth said, I'm uh, Stephen Spazic. I'm a fire artist. I've been working with fire with a with the uh, technique called fumage uh, for the last 20 years now. And my work explores the reality of the Anthropocene. I use fire to reflect uh, the duality of human nature with its um, destructive and constructive uh, powers or forces. And I'm Danielle Delas. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you this afternoon. 
Um, I'm a sustainability and biomimicry educator. Um, of course, I'm also a climate activist and passionate uh, nature lover. My work focuses on regeneration and nurturing a deep connection with nature, which is essential for us to heal the relationship that we currently have with the earth. Um, Steve and I are partners, and one day we decided to merge our passions and our life's work through the Reverence uh, Art Series. And so Reverence is a unique collection of works of art um, that are based on traces left in the soot, that is the medium that Steve works with, by living creatures, and it symbolizes the precariousness of animal and plant life on Earth. And it also serves to bring communities together to regenerate and restore our living systems. So today in the time that we have together, uh, Steve is first gonna show you his technique. He's gonna, you're gonna be able to see him at work. There's short videos so that you can see the detail of how he works with this medium. And then we will talk about the actual reverence projects, particularly through the viewing of a film by uh, Jean-Nicolas Oron, who is our third partner in the reverence series. So the film is about, about 15 minutes, and it really tells the story of how this Monarch project unfolded. And uh, then we'll have a few clips on our second reverence project, which is the Swallow project. And finally, throughout, you will have opportunities to ask questions, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. So Steve, do you want to tell us about your filmage process? With pleasure. Um, first, I want to just talk about my, my preoccupation as an artist and what it is my subject, my main subject, because uh, it's really, uh, it's my language and uh, uh, it's, uh, my art is really based on, on sustained exploration and application of that fumage technique, which is painting with fire. And the focus of my subjects and, and, um, and projects is the relationship between humans and the natural world. My work explores the reality of the current climate crisis and the Anthropocene, uh, highlighting the ambivalence of humanity. This uh, duality of uh, human nature is reflected in the fire and also in the carbon, which is soot. Uh, both of them have the power to nurture or to destroy life. So, so my most recent work or recent show was in uh, earlier, earlier this, this year, early uh, two, 2021, it was in Miami. And the, um, the title of that show was Fire, 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 which was uh, of course about the crisis, the climate crisis. And if you guys are interested in seeing my most recent work, I invite you to visit my website, which is spazup.com. Easy to remember. If you remember my name, you remember my website. Uh, the, on there, you'll see uh, most of those uh, recent work, which is about the climate crisis. And you'll see three different little films that we did to explain my, my preoccupation about uh, the climate crisis. But before making my little live demonstration, I have some cardboard, I have a candle, and I'll show you uh, and I'll get you through my process and I'll explain while I'm doing it. I think it would be best uh, if uh, we could uh, look at two little clips and two or three little clips of me working, uh, of my work uh, in my Franklin studio. Uh, so maybe, uh, Ruth, you can. May you uh, please. So that's my studio. Uh, you'll see me working on a, um, a, a species. Uh, that series were, uh, is, uh, was in Miami and, uh, and it was part of the Fire 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 uh, show. 
the next little clip that I would like to show you um, is more like the, you'll see um, a, a technique that I use uh, with, with color because most of my work is black and white, but as you can see on this, this little clip, I painted a, a blue bird. So the way I do it is uh, I uh, apply the color first, either with acrylics or um, with water-based oil painting. Uh, and then when I scratch, I discover the color underneath the soot. So now I'm scratching with an exacto blade, so it's really precise. Sometimes I use real feathers, as you saw previously. I'll, I'll use real feathers to do some sort of an imprint of a feather on, on the soot. That was uh, a show I did about uh, gun control. And that was in Boston, like in 2018. 18, I yeah. think, yeah. yeah. It was Flower Trigger of Peace, the title of the show. It was my, my, my input on, on guns and firearms. It, I was saying that flower and nature was the antidote of violence and guns. So uh, I think um, just to explain, because uh, probably some of you are artists and they, you're pretty intrigued or interested in, in the process of fumage. And uh, I'll, I'll get you through what uh, my process. So usually I work on, on wooden panels with gesso prepared uh, surface. Uh, which is sanded and really, really soft uh, uh, surface, or I'll, I'll use a, a cardboard. It has to be a bit, it has to be thick because uh, if it's not thick enough, it'll catch fire when I apply the, the fire on it. So this particular paper is uh, acid-free uh, archival, uh, soft, smooth surface. And it's the perfect surface for me to apply the soot because I can really uh, take it off easily with feathers and, and paintbrush and stuff. So surface is number one, it's either uh, panels or cardboard. And of course, a fire. I either work directly with a candle or I'll use a torch, little torch, a tiki torch or anything that will create lots of soot. And um, the third thing is when the drawing is finished, uh, the other third, like a real um, important tool is the varnish. I use a super extra fine spray varnish uh, and that's the way I seal and I protect my work. So, so the way it, it, it's done, it's really easy. It's, it's not burning the paper, it's just applying the the fire on the surface. And um, maybe you can okay. take the control of the crop in the video and I'll just concentrate on what I'm doing. So when the flame touches the, um, the surface, it creates, as you can see, black soot, black carbon. And that's the way I, I work. So either I, I'm, I'm really prepared and I know what I'm going to do, or I just apply the soot and look at it like I would look at clouds and try to see something that appears in it. And if I see something like it, if I see a face or something, I'll, I will work towards that face. Or some, sometimes, uh, now there's not, not much happening, but if I would want to take a, a face out of this, a mass of uh, black carbon, I would just need to uh, remove it with either paint brushes. I use paint brushes or I have this, this um, it's, a, it's a paint brush, but it's a rubber, uh, so there's no hair on it. Or if I want to, if I'm drawing like a, a, a bird, 
and I want to create like the texture of, of the feather on, on the bird, I will actually use real feathers. And I have all these different, I have a bunch of those feathers that I take in, in, in nature where I find some feathers and I use those feathers to, to create a, a feather effect. So as you can see, maybe I can do it closer. Mm -hmm. So as soon as it touches the surface, it's extra fragile. So you can see that if I'm drawing a bird, which is not a bird here, but if I would draw a bird, I would use these to draw the, um, the feather on the bird. Or sometimes I, I will use a, um, a stencil. Let's say I want to be more precise. I'll, I'll cut out a stencil and I'll just apply the soot on it. And the stencil is doing the job of creating the silhouette. And from that, I would then uh, create the, sh the shades and and I would like go and get the um, highlights of, of the skin and everything with different paint brushes. Or I could, I could even uh, erase it more with a, an X-Acto knife, or I have this, this little guy that's really useful. It's an electric, and not the electric, but battery run eraser. That works pretty good. And sometimes I, I, I will cut out some little piece of um, uh, sandpaper. And these are really useful also to scratch and create textures. So that's the way I, um, I, I work uh, with the fumage technique. So there's different tools and, um, uh, and that, that way of working with soot is, it's, um, it's super fragile and I think it works pretty good to talk about the fragility of life and the fragility of nature with a such a fragile uh, medium. And as you can see, it's, it's so fragile. I, I just even, I, I touch it lightly and I'll leave my trace. So if, if anything touches it, it'll leave a trace. So imagine if you know, a little ladybug or ant or any kind of insect will walk on it, it will leave a trace. Um, so that was the base of the medium of uh, our first uh, reverence project uh, for the monarch. We uh, decided, Daniel and I, to uh, let's say, let's, let's create a huge uh, monarch with monarch traces. And that was um, one of the first uh, reverence projects. So maybe we can talk now about why reverence and why we call it reverence and what is our, um, our love for reverence and the way we, we work. Maybe it's, it would be your turn. That would be my turn. But first I'm wondering if uh, Ruth, you have any uh, questions uh, in the Q and A. So this is an invitation for you to type in your question. If you have any questions for Steve about how he works and this was a very rapid introduction yeah. to using uh, soot. So um, this, is, this would be the time where he could answer questions or there will be other opportunities later if uh, nothing comes mm -hmm. up right now. Right, there's nothing quite yet, but I do have one question, and that is, um, I know you can't get into it fully, but Stephen, maybe talk just a, briefly about your progression into this medium, I mean, how, you know, and getting into this, using soot as your actual medium. Um, what did that look like for you? Well, I, I've been using fire for, for the last 20 years, and the the first time that I discovered this technique, it was in my it, it was in a dream. It appeared to me in a dream. So I was uh, I was in my dream in this uh, art gallery and looking at the black and white landscape. And I knew at that point that this artist uh, had done it with a fumage technique with with fire. 
action with an actual uh, candle. So when I woke up, I remembered that dream, and I, I, I since then that was in April 2001, and since then I've been working with fire e almost every day. It's been it's been like a eureka moment. It was uh, wow, this is so incredibly interesting because it it creates all sorts of sh sh uh, shape. And uh, at first, in the first couple of years of exploring that that process, I was really interested in in the randomness of uh, of everything that was appearing in front of me. I was feeling that I was like in the first row of creation, and these shapes would appear, and it would be beautiful. And I was I was really attracted to the randomness of things. And after after a couple of years talking with Danielle and and trying to put more meaning uh, meaningful uh, subjects in my work, we uh, were both nature lovers, and we started to talk about uh, what is actually fire and what is actually carbon, and we put our science and our art together, and we uh, created this really interesting project. Right. And one more question. There was a, a similar question that was asked to what I asked. And then there's another one that says, can you describe uh, your education or experiences that influenced your current art practice? Uh, I have, a, I have a, a bachelor's degree in communication arts, which is graphic design. So when I started my career in my young 20s, I was uh, in advertising. And very, very soon I started my own advertising agency and my design agency. So my brain is sort of um, formed or programmed to create images that are really simple and catchy and you, you see it and you understand the meaning of it because of my background as, as an advertising man. But uh, that didn't last too long because advertising is not uh, as fun as really real art, and meaningful art, not commercial art. Okay, good. I think that's it for now. Should we show the reverence film at this time? Or you have more? Well, I have a little introduction, Ruth, before. Okay, I wanna, good. If, uh, um, if that's okay, I think it would be interesting before we see the film to um, talk just a little bit about reverence and why reverence and why Steve and I decided to put reverence at the center of an art-based series. So um, I'll just go into kind of like digging into the research that we did with regards to reverence. So basically reverence is a feeling of awe and uh, profound respect when we see something that we are that we feel is greater than ourselves and that we can't find an explanation for. So it evokes profound admiration, humility, and a sense of sacredness. Um, and reverence and awe are very closely related. In fact, often they're used as a synonym, but awe is an actual emotion that is um, that all human beings are capable of feeling. So just like um, fear and sadness and joy and all these are co emotions common to all of us. So awe has a very particular, um, how could I say, uh, aspect to it. It's considered a positive emotion, although all emotions are useful and could be considered positive. However, awe has um, the, the, is the only emotion that we feel that allows us to still keep thinking with our uh, cortex. In other words, usually in an emotional response, we're in deep into the emotion and it's difficult to engage uh, in terms of our rational thinking. Um, but with awe, it's actually opening up the pathways to rational thinking because awe puts us in a state or reverence puts us in a state of wanting to understand. So what scientists have found is that um, views like panoramic views and sunsets and northern lights and extraordinary pieces of architectures, works of art, uh, the human body in action, like at the Olympics, or natural phenomenon, like big or small, the scale doesn't matter. It could be microscopic or it could be uh, something very large scale. All of these things um, put us in a situation where we are on the edge of 
fear in a way because we don't understand what's going on, but we are open to learning and we are open to rethinking. We're not using our current frame of reference and that's very unusual. So from a cognitive perspective, it allows cognition in the brain as opposed to other emotions. And um, it also makes us feel small, not in a way of being diminished, but reverence and awe makes us feel what scientists call the small self, which is basically heightened altruism. Like we are less interested in ourselves, more interested in what's around us. And it makes people more humble. It makes people care for other people. So from an evolutionary point of view, what scientists are thinking is that this emotion evolved to make sense of the social context and to support it so that we can all protect each other. So if we think about all of these attributes of awe and reverence, and we put this in an art-based project that is about nature, what we're hoping is that through the uh, actual engagement in the art process, the people who collaborate in these uh, works of art come close to or actually feel reverence and are transformed in their relationship with nature, that there is an openness and a, and a, and a connection that is created so that um, there's, there can be this massive shift that we need towards the transition in restoring a regenerative relationship with our planet. So basically, Steve and I ask two big questions as we are moving forward in this uh, project. And we get all kinds of answers from all kinds of people as they participate from young children to, you know, philosophers. But basically, we ask how can art and reverence come together to spark or create a connection between an individual and nature? And the other question we ask is, is reverence one of the keys to the urgent change that must take place if humans are to relearn to live sustainably on the planet and to choose to change their ways and regenerate and restore the systems? So those are big questions. And we think that art is the extraordinary medium to connect us to nature, which is another extraordinary aspect of our lives. And uh, so in order to like, just so you have a, an idea before we see the film of how we put together a reverence art project, the, the whole project is collaborative and experiential, but it's also uh, centered around the focus of a uh, endangered species that we choose depending on the community and the area where we are going to implement the project. There is a participatory educational program that's developed to make sure that people understand and have an awareness of the per how precarious the species is, and particularly, very concretely, what can we do to protect the species? And inevitably, when we protect one species, we protect many others because our, our choices are going to be beneficial for all of the ecosystem. So, for example, for the Monarch Project, um, what we did, as Steve said, is we collected entomograms, which are little traces of their, you know, footprints in the soot. And um, it was fixed with the, the, the spray that Steve showed before. And then it was cut into thousands of pixels so that all of these pixels of different shades of gray were then used to create what ends up being the self-portrait of a monarch. So monarchs scratched their own portrait into the soot and we put it together with the collaboration of um, a whole community. So the film is by Jean-Nicolas Oran, and Steve will say just a few words about where we were and, and when it happened before we actually start the film. Yeah, it was in 2013, and we, uh, we Daniel and I have a special bond and special love for the monarch uh, butterfly. Uh, um, it's our, really, it's our... It's our butterfly. It's our butterfly. <laughs> it's our favorite butterfly. And so we, we decided to, uh, let's do a project, uh, a reverence project uh, in uh, Mexico where all the butterflies uh, ends up being in this uh, Reserve Phonique. It's called La Reserva de la Biosfera Mariposa y Monarca. It was in Miocan in Mexico. That was, so that was in two, 2013. And we work with an art class in Morelia, uh, in Mexico. And from with those, all these traces captured in Mexico, we brought it back with us in Montreal, work with the University, University du Québec à Montréal, 
and also an high school in Montreal, the St. George High School. And together, all these communities and all these people work together to create this uh, big monarch. So maybe we can watch the film now. I've been working with fire since 2001, and I discovered that technique in a dream, actually. I dreamt that I was uh, looking at this painting in a gallery, and this, this painting was done with fire, and I knew it in my dream that it was done with fire. So uh, when I woke up that next morning, I decided to try it, and since then I've been working with fire. Working f with fire is like working with any kind of pencil or paintbrush. It's instead of using those, you just use the flame of a candle. And when it touches the surface, it creates soot. And from those traces, I either leave them as is and work with the uh, randomness of those shapes, or I really sculpt them into a very figurative uh, drawing. Danielle was a science teacher all of her life. She's really specialized in environmental education. She's a lover of nature. She, she's, she's a genius in uh, sharing her passion for nature. She really communicates very well, especially with children. Yeah, I think for me, when we were walking on the path, there was a great deal of anticipation and excitement about uh, seeing what I wanted to see pretty much my whole life, uh, a sanctuary filled with millions of monarchs all together hanging on trees. I, I could not wait for that sight. So the first butterfly that, as Steve said, greeted us and, and welcomed us into the forest was so exciting to see this one butterfly. And then there were more and more and more. And, Eventually, we got to that place where at the center of the forest, there are these Oyamel trees, these pines covered by these monarchs. And the color was such that in the sun, it looked like the underwing of the monarchs has a shade of rusty brown. So it actually looked like the trees, the leaves are brown and those are big clumps of leaves just hanging on the branches. And then as we approach, we realize that those were, in fact, the monarchs. It was a true moment of reference. I felt like I was entering a cathedral of life, a spectacle of nature that was, um, that I was so privileged to share with others and to see myself.
an entomogram is a, is a new word, is a word that I invented, uh, that we invented because um, it's, it, it says entomo, entomo is a prefix for um, insects, and gram is for graphie, for uh, drawing. So it's a drawing done by insects. is actually a tropical species and so it has adapted in the most incredible way to being able to live in the north yet survive the winters by simply migrating away from the cold regions of its uh, distribution area. So basically monarchs start uh, will start it in, in the end of February, March and in three or four generations as the milkweed appears the monarchs migrate north and all monarchs that live on the east of the Rockies will actually, after a summer uh, in Canada and the United States, will actually start migrating back to Mexico where they're gonna hibernate. So this migration is done in one generation. The butterfly takes about 100 days to fly close to 3,000 kilometers. And they merge, they congregate all in these exact same places on the exact same trees year after year. The fascinating part of, of, about that species is that the monarch that is born here in Canada will migrate down south and will live three times longer than his parents, grandparents, and, and, and so on. They are programmed to go south as their parents were programmed, all their parents were programmed to go north. So that's really fascinating. It's like a, a relay race for survival. Yet no yeah. one, we don't know where the instructions come from. Knowing that the, the population are collapsing, Knowing that, and knowing that maybe we can lose those butterflies, if we would lose those butterflies, it wouldn't be a just loss of, of one orange butterfly. It would be that mysterious thing about nature. It's what makes life so mysterious and so beautiful to live. You want those, those magic moments, those magic living things. You don't want to extinguish that. Monarchs are part of the groups of insects that are butterflies or lepidopteras. And that group of insects have scales on their wings that create patterns of color. Yeah, if you, if you look at a wing of a monarch or any kind of butterfly, if you look at, at a wing underneath a microscope, you'll see that it's all composed of little squares or little scales. And there's a rapport formel. There's a there's a perfect analogy between that scale factor in the wing and our work of art because it's all done with little pixels. It's, it looks the same. And if we take this metaphor analogy even further, collectively, hundreds of people have worked on this project and contributed to what is in the end this large self-portrait of the monarch with the mission of um, engaging people in protecting it. So that again in itself is a mosaic of a community of people who care and want to bring change in this world.
Scientists estimate that in the last 10 years, approximately 90% of the population of monarch has disappeared. So that is alarming, it's, it's dramatic. And the reason for that is that um, there are multiple causes. Deforestation, um, herbicides, genetically modified monocultures are main uh, factors. Climate change is another, as well as overall, the impact of all these things is that monarchs are losing their habitats. So the solution to help the monarch is to actually create habitats. It is incredibly surprising how resilient life is. And in fact, a, a person who wishes to have a very small garden with uh, indigenous nectar producing flowers, as well as a few milkweed plants, can become an oasis for monarchs. It can become the lifeline that the monarchs need to move around and find what they need to survive. So um, thank you for watching. If uh, there's any question, don't hesitate uh, to, to ask. We will answer gladly. Maybe uh, we can talk about the second uh, project we did, which was the, with the swallow. And continue to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll, we'll answer them at the end. So as you can see, the uh, traces that the monarchs left in the soot were the foundation or the medium for the large portrait that was created. Um, 15,000 pixels were used in making that portrait. For the Swallow Project, when we considered how do we ethically and respectfully collect Swallow prints, it quickly became evident that that was not possible. And so we had to rethink well, how do we continue with a reverence series if we can't possibly collect the prints of the animals in the same way that the first one was made? And basically we thought, well, what we need to do is to actually collect the prints of the individuals, the people, the humans who are part of this project, because it would symbolize how humans and animals and plants and all living things are actually one. We are all uh, together on this planet as one. And so since humans are nature, we decided to use the prints of humans. Um, and so basically we collected facial prints, fingerprints, um, and, and uh, also handprints in the soot. And uh, in the same way that the, the uh, cardboard was fixed with some uh, varnish and then cut into pixels, we did the same thing, but with uh, a, a swallow perspective. There was a, again, an educational program that was developed, but this time it was created and we mentored grades five and six students who engaged their whole school, the whole 600 students in their school, all the teachers, the administration in their school, as well as the local community through a local wildlife reserve. And they had a whole educational program around the swallows and Steve and I were there to collect the prints of all the people who participated and pledged to take care and take action to protect the swallows that have the same fate as the monarch. Their populations have declined also by 90% in the last decades for actually the very same reasons, lack of habitat, destruction of their food, um, through uh, pesticides and so on. So let's look at a few clips. They're very short, couple of minutes each. Uh, again, the film was by Jean-Nicolas Oron, and uh, you'll get a sense of the second projects of reverence that we did together.
D'habitude, quand je fais ça, tout le... personne parle, c'est très bizarre. J'ai simplement appliqué de la suie sur, euh, sur le carton, mais quand j'enlève ça, on voit Loan apparaître. Fait que Loan, je vais, je vais te coller ça sur, sur le visage, OK? T'as pas besoin de fermer tes yeux ou quoi que ce soit, soit comme bien neutre. Alors, on est prêt? Moi, ce qui, ce qui m'importe, c'est d'avoir une trace de toi, une, une partie de toi pour mettre et pour faire l'hirondelle. Apologize. I forgot to mention that the uh, the film, the short films are in French. The translation is not quite finished yet, but nonetheless, the images speak. Thank you. Quels sont les engagements clairs qu'on pourrait solliciter, promouvoir et demander aux gens de faire et que vous pouvez choisir vous aussi pour s'en aller vers notre vision? C'est pas nécessairement acheter des choses genre que c'est recyclable, compostable, mais acheter ce qu'on a besoin. Que les faits ou une vision utopique qu'on n'est pas capable de, de se créer, d'accord? Puis on est en train de le faire ensemble. So those were little two clips uh, coming from a 15-minute um, uh, video did by, done by uh, Jean-Nicolas Oron. And we're still working with Jean-Nicolas on, on the, ne the next uh, reverence project. And we're working actually on, on proposing a long feature uh, film on reverence and trying to find uh, people around the world that will talk to us about the reverence uh, moment in nature and try to capture some soot with them and eventually make a long feature. So um, we're, we're now exploring the possibility of creating a reverence project with the Grand Marais Art Colony uh, in the near, near future. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're, we're in the process of uh, working on something. So Ruth. Any more questions, anyone? Oh. Yeah. I'm here, I'm gonna pop back in. I think all of those who have watched, you, you have succeeded in, I like how you say reverence a lot more than how I do, but you have succeeded in, at least if, you, if any of the attendees are like me in conveying that. And so it's one of those uh, times where I think also it's, it's hard to talk after viewing your work mm -hmm. because it, it creates this stillness and contemplation about the work you're doing and what is being amplified um, and certainly the sense of awe and kind of, I'm a little person <laughs> in the midst, in the midst of that. We do have one question about personal wellness right now. And the question is, if you could speak to your process 
and how how it overlaps with personal wellness. And I'm not sure if it's it maybe you or your how you want to um, maybe convey that to others. Want to take that one? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'll 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 answer the question, and and Steve can right. add to it. Um, if I understand the question correctly, I think what is what is being asked is maybe what's the connection between reverence and well-being, our personal well-being, and how we are experiencing that. And um, so I'll answer from my understanding. And basically, what I would want to say to this is, over the course of our um, Increase the awareness and understanding of what reverence is. And of course, that stems from having experienced it. And actually, the average uh, answer from, sci from a scientific investigation is that on average, we experience a moment of reverence about twice a week. So that's actually quite a lot. And so we are sometimes caught in such a pace of life that we don't notice them or we don't actually stop and feel them in that very moment. So in terms of well-being, if I could say what this whole pr process that we are engaging in and will continue to evolve has offered Steve and I, it's the possibility of actually paying attention to those moments and really being filled with the gratitude, taking in the beauty. I cannot explain the impact of being able to do that and taking the time to do that um, and how it impacts our well-being in terms of reducing stress, bringing happiness, bringing us back to simple things. I mean, like all of you, I'm sure we all have lives that are very rich and sometimes complex and filled with what society is imposing on us as consumers in a, in a capitalist world. And um, bringing everything back to nature and the beauty and the simplicity and the awe that we can have for the intelligence of nature. Um, it shifts a lot. So in terms of our well-being, I would say it's, it, it's a difficult to give a short answer, but I would say that that's the primary impact. I don't know, Steve, you want to add anything to that? I don't know, it's perfect. I would have answered that like that, but she did. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a question. Uh, attendee is saying it's very exciting work and way of building with community and maybe a little bit more about uh, the project in Grand Marais. And so I can just say um, that is in the works, we are looking at grant funding. We are looking at two to three at least partners in that process to help bring a few different practitioners together um, in order to inform. And, um, and so we're at the beginning stages of, of what that looks like, except that I am 100% sure we are gonna make it happen because I'm so excited about it. I think it's gonna be an amazing thing for our community to go through and learn uh, more about where we live. And then the amplification goes way beyond our local geographic area. Um, one question that has come up is, well, Chelly Anderson is with us and, <clears throat> and she's been working with us on this project as well. I'll just say she's the co-author of um, A Natural History of the Superior Coast and an ecologist herself. And so she she said, glad you are in this world and can't wait for you to come to Grand Marais. Do you think this process can be applied to a community of living things as well as a species? Oh, good, good, good. Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. Uh, because a living species is, it could be a system, could be, yeah. For sure. sure. Yeah. So, so our understanding is putting at the center of the project, the focus being on a system rather than mm -hmm. just an individual species. Yeah. So yes, with great excitement. <laughs> uh, of course, it would be a system that is endangered or, or needs to be sh sh shine the light on. So yes, uh, a system could be interesting. Yeah, good, that? great idea. Mm -hmm. yes. um, Man, can we ask a question? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I was actually, Chell, I'm going to allow you to talk here. You don't have to do your video or not, but if you unmute yourself, we're going to go off script here a little bit. And um, if there is a way to ask a question back, please do. We'll see if, if she yeah. can. Just have to unmute yourself, Shell. Or maybe, wait, I think, Ruth, you have um, yeah. a system you've put uh, all participants are muted on entry. 
Uh, probably. Yeah. Oh, she's not. No, in. she's there. Yep. Good. Hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> How wonderful to see your faces. <laughs> Thank you. What's your question? I don't want it to make it about me. This is about okay. your work. <laughs> My question would be, do you have something in mind when you think of uh, uh, shining light on a system and, and making a reverence project on a system? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. I do, um, I, not just one. I mean, I could think of a few. So, um, I, you know, you know, we have uh, we have uh, aquatic systems that are endangered now by changes in the climate. We have forest systems um, uh, uh, that are a part of our community writ large that um, are endangered by lots of things, not just climate, but lots of things. And um, so there are a lot of, we have Lake Superior shore communities that are um, even without climate change, they're, um, they're very uh, sensitive to changes. And so, I, yeah, I think there are options. I don't know that any of those are the best choices, but yes, I certainly could think of some options and so many um, you know, just amazing, mind-blowing species that are parts of them mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, so. <laughs> so the answer is yes, and, and my mind is already, you know, going <laughs> how this could happen and how we could create this network of, uh, you know, different focus, focus that comes together. And so, yes, Jill, great idea. We have it noted down. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Can't wait. Thank yeah, thank you for letting me put you on the spot, Shell. I know from our conversations, it was that sentiment that there are individual species, certainly, that are struggling with there's such a, a pyramid of interconnectedness that happens, and that you've seen that in our region, particularly, you know, and how they're interdependent on each other. I think um, for anyone attending, there are a lot of options to consider and um, and just to think through as we as we model this, but so excited to go forward with it. Um, so there is another. Um, sorry, just one second. Uh, there is one more question that was about uh, your technique again, Stephen, regarding if you have you know a lot of it is almost like a low relief sculptural look or the mark making look have you ever experimented with more 3d art with your technique yes uh, i've been i did a, in the past a few um work on class and uh, I, I work uh, on, on a piece of glass so it's transparent and if you apply like each uh, piece of glass together you uh, end up having like a three dimensional uh, soot cloud or something. Uh, you can see those on my website. I think there's a few uh, glass sculptures. And in videos, there. yeah. And videos, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, one last, any other questions? I guess one last opportunity. If you have a question, answer it. I think, again, we're just, we're so thankful for your time, your work. I mean, it's, it's huge life work that you are doing and it feels, um, I'm sure, you know, small steps toward completing a project. Uh, there's many small steps to getting there. And um, we look forward to hopefully walking through a project with you. So those who are attending, just know that there will be more to come. And um, any last, comment that either of you want to make at this point. Maybe maybe I'm curious about your polar bear or the Ecuador project if have there been more formation of either of those projects. Well in in of course we want to make more projects and and but uh, recently we've been asking ourselves should we should we travel so much like go to Antarctica and go to China and for the panda and stuff, it, it, it creates a footprint that is not aligned with our thinking and with our reverence project. So with Jean-Nicolas Oron and working on the long feature, we're, we're thinking of, of collaborating with other artists around the world and 
and maybe they would create the imprint for us and other uh, cin cinematographer would film for Jean-Claude the pietage uh, or the uh, film that we would need and it would be like like we're, we're, what we're doing today on a Zoom could be, uh, but we we have uh, lots of uh, of ideas and uh, species that we would love to include in our project, but uh, we'll try to minimize our impact if if doing it the way I just said or going in these places and capturing the imprints. But if we do that, we'll we'll have to compensate and, and plant trees neutralize, and yeah. neutralize the whole process. With carbon credits, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so so many levels to think about. Danielle, anything else you want to say before we close I'm, out? Thank you. I'm just uh, you know very grateful that you uh, gave us this opportunity to share. And uh, thank you to all of you who participated and um, stayed with us on this lovely Saturday afternoon to, to learn more about monarchs and, and reverence. And we really look forward to just continue to move this forward. Thank you. One last comment that just said, this was magical. Thank you. Thank you. Uh. Which I think is <laughs> everyone's sentiment. Um, I just invite attendees to know our website is grandmarieartcolony.org. There's a donate button on that site as well. This event is part of our free series and we want to make it accessible and we also welcome your support to continue it. So again, if you want to know more, it's easy to get on our e-newsletter list on the homepage of our website and check out uh, Stephen's artwork on his site. So we thank you for joining us and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Oh, bye. Bye. bye everyone.